Uh, since I see, most excellent Diognetus, that you are exceedingly anxious to understand the religion of the Christians, and that your inquiries respecting them are distinctly and carefully made as to what God they trust and how they worship him, that they all disregard the world and despise death and take no account of those who are regarded as gods by the Greeks, neither observe the superstition of the Jews, and as to the nature of the affection which they entertain one to another, and of this new development or interest which has entered into men's lives now and not before. I gladly welcome this zeal in you, and I ask of God, who supplies both the speaking and the hearing to us, that it may be granted to myself to speak in such a way that you may be made better by the hearing, and to you that you may mayest so listen that I, the speaker, may not be disappointed. Come then, I guess I should give you the references, uh, paragraph two. It's not all that long, so you can look. It's available online. Um, in numerous different translations. Come then, clear yourself of all the prepossessions which occupy your mind, and throw off the habit which leads thee astray, and become a new man, as it were, from the beginning, as one who would listen to a new story, even as you yourself did confess. See not only with your eyes, but with your intellect also, of what substance or of what form they chance to be whom you call and regard as gods. Is not one of them stone, like that which we tread underfoot, and another bronze, no better than the vessels which we forged for our use, and another wood, uh, which has already become rotten, and another silver, which needs a man to guard it, lest it be stolen, and another iron, which is corroded with rust, and another earthenware, not a bit more comely than that which is supplied for the most dishonorable service? Are not all of these perishable matter? Are they not forged by iron and fire? Did not the sculptor make one and the brass founder another and the silversmith another and the potter another? Before they were molded into this shape by the crafts of these several artificers, was it not possible for each one of them to have been changed in form and made to resemble these several utensils? Might not the vessels, which are now made out of the same material, if they met with the same artificers, been made like unto such as these? Could not these things, which are now worshipped by you, by human hands again be made vessels like the rest? Are not they all deaf and blind? Are they not soulless, senseless, motionless? Do they not rot and decay? These things you call gods. To these you are slaves. These you worship. And you end by becoming altogether like unto them. Therefore, you hate the Christians because they, don't, they do not consider these to be gods. For do not you yourselves, who now regard and worship them, much more despise them? Do you not much rather mock and insult them, worshiping those that are of stone and earthenware unguarded, but shutting up those that are of silver and gold by night, and setting cards over them by day to prevent their being stolen? And as for the honors which you think to offer to them, if they are sensible of them, you rather punish them thereby, Whereas if they are insensible, you reproach them by propitiating them with the blood and fat of victims. Let one of yourselves undergo this treatment. Let him submit to these things being done to him. No, not so much as a single individual will willingly submit to such punishment, for he has sensibility and reason, but a stone submits because it is insensible. Therefore, you convict his sensibility. Well, I could say much besides concerning the Christians not being enslaved to such gods as these, but if anyone should think that but if anyone should think what has been said insufficient, I hold it superfluous to say more. Paragraph 3. In the next place, I fancy that you are chiefly anxious to hear about their not practicing their religion in the same way as the Jews. The Jews then, so far as they abstain from the mode of worship described above, do well in claiming to reverence one God of the universe and to regard him as master. But so far as they offer him this worship in methods similar to those already mentioned, they are altogether at fault. 
For whereas the Greeks, by offering these things to senseless and deaf images, make an exhibition of stupidity, the Jews, considering that they are presenting them to God as if he were in need of them, ought in all reason to count it folly and not religious worship. For he that made the heaven and the earth and all things that are therein, and furnishes us with all that we need, cannot himself need any of these things which he himself supplies to them that imagine they are giving them to him. But those who think to perform sacrifices to him with blood and fat and whole burnt offerings and to honor him with such honors seem to me in no way different than those who show the same respect towards deaf images. For the one class think fit to make offerings to things unable to participate in the honor, the other class to one who is in need of nothing. Paragraph four. But again, their scruples concerning meats and their superstition relating to the Sabbath and the vanity of their circumcision and the dissimulation of their fasting and new moons, I do not suppose you need to learn from me, are ridiculous and unworthy of any consideration. For of the things created by God for the use of man, to receive some as created well, but to decline others as useless and superfluous, is not this impious? And again, to lie against God, as if he forbade us to do any good thing on the Sabbath day, is not this profane? Again, to vaunt the mutilation of the flesh as a token of election, as though for this reason they were particularly beloved by God, is not this ridiculous? And to watch the stars and the moon, and to keep the observance of months and of days, and distinguish the arrangements of God and the changes of the seasons according to their own impulses, making some into festivals and others into times of mourning, who would regard this as an exhibition of godliness and not much more of folly? That the Christians are right, therefore, in holding aloof from the common silliness and error of the Jews, and from their excessive fussiness and pride, I consider that thou hast been sufficiently instructed." But as regards the mystery of their own religion, expect not that you can be instructed by man. Thus the reading through paragraph four. Paragraph five. For Christians are not distinguished from the rest of mankind, either in locality or in speech or in customs. For they dwell not somewhere in the cities of their own, neither do they use some different language nor practice an extraordinary kind of life. Nor again do they possess any invention discovered by any intelligence or study of ingenious men, nor are they masters of any human dogma as some are. But while they dwell in cities of Greeks and barbarians as the lot of each is cast, and follow the native customs and dress and food and the other arrangements of life, yet the constitution of our own citizenship, which they set forth, is marvelous and confessedly contradicts expectation." They dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. They bear their share in all things as citizens, and they endure all hardships as strangers. Every foreign country is a fatherland to them, and every fatherland is foreign. They marry like all other men, and they beget children, but they do not cast away their offspring. Catch that. They have their meals in common, but not their wives. They find themselves in the flesh, and yet they live not after the flesh. Their existence is on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, and they surpass the laws in their own lives. They love all men, and they are persecuted by all. They are ignored, and yet they are condemned. They are put to death, and yet they are endued with life. They are in beggary, and yet, they, and yet they make many rich. They are in want of all things, and yet they abound in all things. They are dishonored, and yet they are glorified in their dishonor. They are evil spoken of, and yet they are vindicated. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted, and they respect. Doing good, they are punished as evildoers. Being punished, they rejoice, and if they were thereby, as if they were thereby quickened by life. War is waged against them as aliens by the Jews, and persecution is carried on against them by the Greeks, and yet those that hate them cannot tell the reason of their hostility. Paragraph 6. In a word, what the soul is in a body, this the Christians are in the world. The soul is spread through all the members of the body and Christians through the diverse cities of the world. The soul has its abode in the body, yet it is not of the body. So Christians have their abode in the world, yet they are not of the world. 
The soul, which is invisible, is guarded in the body, which is visible. So Christians are recognized as being in the world, and yet their religion remains invisible. The flesh hates the soul and wages war with it, though it receives no wrong, because it is forbidden to indulge in pleasures. So the world hates Christians, though it receives no wrong from them, because they themselves, because they set themselves against its pleasures. The soul loves the flesh, which hates it, and the members, so Christians love those that hate them. The soul is enclosed in the body, and yet itself holds the body together. So Christians are kept in the world as in a prison house, and yet they themselves hold the world together. The soul, though itself immortal, dwells in a mortal tabernacle. So Christians sojourn amidst perishable things, while they look for the imperishability which is in the heavens." The soul, when hardly treated in the matter of meats and drinks, is improved. And so Christians, when punished, increase more and more daily. So great is the office for which God has appointed them, in which it is not lawful for them to decline. Paragraph 7. For it is no earthly... By the way, there's only 10 paragraphs. For it is no earthly discovery, as I said, which was committed to them, neither do they care to guard so carefully any mortal invention, nor have they entrusted to them the dispensation of human mysteries. But truly, the almighty creator of the universe, the invisible God himself, from heaven planted among men the truth and the holy teaching which surpasses the wit of men, and fixed it firmly in their hearts, not as any man might imagine, by sending to mankind a subaltern, or angel, or ruler, or one of those that direct the affairs of men, or one of those who have been entrusted with the dispensations in heaven, but the very artificer and creator of the universe himself, by whom he made the heavens, by whom he enclosed the sea in its proper bounds, whose mysteries all the elements faithfully observe, from whom the sun has received even the measure of the courses of the day to keep them, whom the moon obeys as he bids her shine by night, whom the stars obey as they follow the course of the moon, by whom all things are ordered and bounded and placed in subjection, the heavens and the things that are in the heavens, the earth and the things that are in the earth, the sea and the things that are in the sea, fire, air, abyss, the things that are in the heights, the things that are in the depths, the things that are between the two, him he sent unto them." Was he sent, do you think, as any man might suppose, to establish a sovereignty, to inspire fear and terror? Not so. But in gentleness and meekness has he sent him, as a king might send his son, who is a king. He sent him as sending God. He sent him as a man unto men. He sent him as he sent him as summoning God not as persecuting. He sent him as loving, not as judging. For he will send him, for he will send him in judgment and who shall endure his presence. Do you not see them thrown to wild beasts? And so they may deny the Lord and yet not overcome. Do you not see that the more of them are punished? Just so many others abound. These look not like the works of a man, They are the power of God. They are the proofs of his presence. Paragraph eight. For what man at all had any knowledge what God was before he came? Or do you accept the empty and nonsensical statements of those pretentious philosophers of whom some said that God was fire? They call that God whereunto they themselves shall go and others water and others, some other of the elements which were created by God. And yet, if any of these statements is worthy of acceptance, any one other created thing might just as well be made out to be God. No, all this is the quackery and deceit of the magicians, and no man has either seen or recognized him, but he revealed himself. And he revealed himself by faith, whereby alone it is given to see God. For God, the master and creator of the universe, who made all things and arranged them in order, was found to be not only friendly to men, but also long-suffering. And such indeed he was always, and is, and will be, 
kindly and good and dispassionate and true, and he alone is good. And having conceived a great and unutterable scheme, he committed it to his son, I'm sorry, he communicated it to his son alone. For so long as he kept and guarded his wise design as a mystery, he seemed to neglect us and to be careless about us. But when he revealed it through his beloved son and manifested the purpose which he had prepared from the beginning, he gave us all these gifts at once, participation in his benefits, and sight and understanding of mysteries which none of us ever would have expected. Paragraph 9. Having thus planned everything already in his mind with his son, he permitted us during the former time to be borne along by disorderly impulses as we desired, led astray by pleasures and lusts, not at all because he took delight in our sins, but because he bore with us, not because he approved of the past season of iniquity, but because he was creating the present season of righteousness, that, being convicted in the past time by our own deeds as unworthy of life, we might now be made deserving by the goodness of God and having made clear our inability to enter into the kingdom of God of ourselves might be enabled by the ability of God. And when our iniquity had been fully accomplished and it had been made perfectly manifest that punishment and death were expected as its recompense and the season came which God had ordained when henceforth he should manifest his goodness and power, O oh, the exceeding great kindness and love of God. He hated us not, neither rejected us, nor bore us malice, but was long-suffering and patient, and in pity for us took upon himself our sins, and himself parted with his Son as a ransom for us, the holy for the lawless, the, guilt, the guileless for the evil, the just for the unjust, the incorruptible for the corruptible, the immortal for the mortal, for what else but his righteousness would have covered our sins? In whom was it possible for us lawless and ungodly men to have been justified, save only in the Son of God? Oh, the sweet exchange! Oh, the inscrutable creation! Oh, the unexpected benefits! Then the, that the iniquity of many should be concealed in one righteous man, and the righteousness of one should justify many that are iniquitous. Having then in the former time demonstrated the inability of our nature to obtain life, and having now revealed a Savior able to save even creatures which have no ability, he willed that for both reasons we should believe in his goodness and should regard him as nurse, father, teacher, counselor, physician, mind, light, honor, glory, strength, and life. That was paragraph nine, in case you missed the counting, but that's the key paragraph. We'll be looking at it again in a moment. Final paragraph, because it breaks off suddenly, and paragraphs 11 and 12 are plainly written by someone else at another time. So it just breaks off. That's, it's amazing we have as much of it as we have. This faith if you also desire, apprehends first full knowledge of the Father. For God loved men, for whose sake he made the world, to whom he subjected all things that are in the earth, to whom he gave reason and mind, whom alone he permitted to look up to the heavens, whom he created after his own image, to whom he sent his only begotten Son, to whom he promised the kingdom which is in heaven, and will give it to those that have loved him. And when you have attained this full knowledge, with what joy do you think that you will be filled, or how will you love him that so loved you before? And loving him, you will be an imitator of his goodness. And marvel not that a man can be an imitator of God. He can, if God wills it. For happiness consists not in lordship over one's neighbors, nor in desiring to have more than weaker men, nor in possessing wealth and using force to inferiors. Neither can anyone imitate God in these matters, nay, these lie outside his greatness. But whoever takes upon himself the burden of his neighbor, whoever desires to benefit one that is worse off in that in which he himself is superior, whoever, may, whoever by supplying to those that are in want 
possessions which he received from God becomes a God to those who receive them from him. He is an imitator of God. Then, though you are placed on earth, you shall behold the God that lives in heaven. Then shall you begin to declare the mysteries of God. Then shall you both love and admire those that are punished because they will not deny God. Then you shall, then shall, then you shall condemn the deceit and error of the world when you shall perceive the true life which is in the heavens, when you shall despise the apparent death which is here on earth, when you shall fear the real death which is, which is reserved for those that shall be condemned to the eternal fire that shall punish those delivered over to it unto the end. Then you shall admire those who endure for righteousness' sake the fire that is for a season and shall count them blessed when you perceive that fire breaks off at that point, breaks off at that point. So there is the epistle to Diognetus. Aren't you blessed? 